Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sarah, I'm a junior doctor working near London. And in this video, I wanted to share what a typical day working during Ramadan is like. I'm currently on night shift, so the pattern is gonna be a bit weird. And you would think that fasting whilst working on nights is a good thing because you can theoretically eat throughout the night and drink. And that's what I thought as well, but I soon found out that that is not really the case. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the vlog. Sarah the medical effort on call. Mm -hmm. Does he have an old BBG? What what's the potassium on the old BBG? So it's improving. Okay. Um, and what was his pH in the last BBG? No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's four a.m. already. Um, I'm in a good mood. I've had something to eat um, and I'm not having to run around for bleeps at the moment, which is a good thing. My, I'm working with a really cool SHO today, so SHO is Senior House Officer um, and he was very keen to go around and do jobs together, which is great because it means that I can learn from him and see how he assesses patients, etc. Um, we haven't been doing everything together just because He's been called away and I've had to do things, um, which is fine, but it's a nice combination of still seeing some patients together. So it's different from the other nights and I think it's quite nice. So I mentioned earlier on that I was going around with the medical SHO um, for quite a few jobs and it was really good to be able to learn from him and discuss cases. Um, so I really enjoyed that. But the other reason that I really appreciate this medical SHO is this. So I do not understand why F1s on call do not have a phone. We just have a bleep. So typically I would be bleeped, which basically means that this starts ringing. There's a number that comes on here and then I have to find a phone to be able to call back, which makes it pretty inconvenient when I'm running around the hospital um, and going from one ward to another. So having this phone is amazing because I can answer bleeps while I'm heading to a ward um, and it really saves a lot of time. Um, usually it's quite hard to find these. They are very precious. Um, and again, I don't understand why we don't have these because it makes life so much easier. So he knew all the secret spots where I could get them. We struggled to find one initially, uh, but finally got a dead phone, found a battery, and now life is so much better with this phone. Night has been uh, pretty good so far. Um, I've had a few interesting cases. I've reviewed a couple of falls. Um, for falls, you want to make sure that the patient has not had a head injury, that they're not on any, any blood thinners, um, and you check things like whether they've had a postural drop. Basically, you want to figure out why they've fallen and then how bad have they hurt themselves once they've fallen. If they are on blood thinners, for example, and they've hit their head, um, then you may want to consider a CT head just to make sure that there isn't a bleed. If they've got a postural drop in their blood pressure, you might consider some fluids or review their medication just to make sure that there isn't anything causing this drop. I also saw a patient with chest pain. Another one was very agitated and the nurse wanted me to prescribe some uh, lorazepam, which is basically like a tranquilizer. Um, and we have a very high threshold for, for giving that to patients because obviously any medication has side effects and if a patient's upset or making noise and disturbing the ward, yes it's not ideal but that's not a reason enough to um, prescribe them that medication. So the first thing you do is review the patient, try to de-escalate the situation if they're distressed, um, they might be in pain and that's why they're agitated so you try and treat the cause whenever you can. Um, it may be that they're confused and uh, then you need to figure out what the cause of that is, whether it's an infection or if they're in urinary retention, if they've not opened their bowels. It can be lots of different things. So you still, like I mentioned in my first vlog, you still always do your same systematic approach of A to E, um, going through everything to make sure that you don't have an obvious cause um, instead of just prescribing lorazepam straight away and you know not really addressing the problem. What else did I see? 
I've had a few like prescribing gentamicin. I might try and grab a drug chart just to show you the typical kind of things that we have to prescribe. A lot of it is oftentimes pain medication, so you want to make sure that you increase the pain medication in a stepwise manner, which basically means you start with simple analgesia like paracetamol. You might you may need to go up to an anti-inflammatory. Um, and include things like weak opioids and finally consider something stronger. The other thing that you consider as well is whether the pain medication should be given regularly or if it can be in the PRN side which is basically whenever the patient needs a bit of a top up. Overnight it can be a bit tricky because you don't want to make any uh, big changes to a person's medication or management and even if you read through the note it's sometimes difficult to get a whole picture of uh, what a patient's current issues are and how they're being managed. So that's a bit of a downer on night shifts, but there's still something I really enjoy about empty hospitals um, and there's a, a sense of quiet that you don't have during the day. I think for a night shift you have to experience it to know what it's like. I've got a list of non-urgent jobs at the moment, so because I'm not getting bleeped for an urgent review I'm just going to go around um, and do those. Again, those are things like prescribing medication or just reviewing a couple of things. Um, and then I need to chase a few scans that are probably not going to happen overnight, uh, but I need to make sure that I check. And yeah, we're getting there. So I'm more than halfway through my shift now. sleep deprived is not good for your health. I would not want to do night shifts forever. There are some people who enjoy this. Night nurse practitioners is a thing, so it's basically nurses who work only on night shifts all the time. I think they do two weeks of night shift. They do 12 days a month of night shifts, or 14 days a month. And then the rest of the time they have off. So in theory, you would think that that's a really good deal but it's not because I mean I guess they wouldn't have to change their shift pattern they would just stay on nights all the time um, but I think it's really really tough and I feel a bit delirious uh, it's not easy doing it while you're fasting as well you would think that it's easier because you're able to eat and hydrate the whole night and then sleep during the day that's what I thought but actually, you can't really time everything right at night and you uh, will get called away multiple times. Um, thankfully, I managed to eat something and hydrate a bit before the morning prayer. Um, but I was carrying my water bottle around with me and I just didn't have time to really sit down and drink properly and hydrate. So it's a lot more rushed at night which makes it difficult. Nights are great if you didn't have to be so tired because of the changing pattern, sleep patterns. Um, I would really, really enjoy it because if you're lucky, you've got a fantastic team and there's more opportunity to learn. You feel like you're doing more medicine because during the day there's a lot of admin work, um, there's a lot of paperwork that you need to get through and at night you make sure you keep everyone alive in the hospital. You, you do your best in any case. Um, and it's less about um, doing the day-to-day -day stuff and it's more about managing the acutely unwell patients and keeping everyone um, on board until the morning team arrive. Fr from that perspective, you can avoid quite a lot of grunt work um, and just do the medicine. There's also, I keep saying this, there's also a really nice vibe in the hospital when it's completely empty and I kind of enjoy that. I've been really, really lucky both sets of nights. I've had a really great team. There was a really interesting case today. Um, in the last hour of the morning, there were five or six news calls. Um, I mentioned in a previous video, news calls are essentially when a patient is very poorly and the scoring system uh, of their observations that we have in the hospital, so things like their heart rate, their blood pressure, their temperature, their oxygen saturations. If the severity of these scores total uh, a certain number then they put out a call and the F1 SHO medical registrar will come to see the patient and review them so typically they will be quite poorly and one of these calls was for an 86 year old lady who'd come in with multiple falls 
um, she had some confusion um, and she was being treated for a UTI. She had a massive rectal bleed. She soaked through four pads and uh, filled the bedpan uh, completely. She was also on warfarin, so that's a blood thinner. And uh, we immediately reversed that with vitamin K, gave her some Beriplex, made sure she was stable so her blood pressure hadn't dropped. And we sent her for a CT scan of her tummy. And we found a massive fecal load. So essentially, if you imagine a massive ball of poo stuck in the lower gut, and that had caused the bowel wall to rupture and cause the bleeding. So this is something that's most likely going to be operated on. There's a massive risk of bleed, there's a massive risk of infection because some of the fecal matter can basically get lost in the gut. So it's really, really serious. We were discussing how this could have happened because essentially this would happen to somebody who's not opened their bowels for a good couple of days. And um, in hospitals, all patients have stool charts so that we can see if a patient has not opened their bowels for the last two or three days and we can act accordingly, give them some laxatives. So she had had very limited bowel movements um, and either she just not opened her bowels for the last few days or it could have been masked because you can have diarrhea overflow. So that's when you've got an obstruction um, or build up of fecal matter in your uh, bowels. but. Uh, that triggers the guts to release a lot of fluid and you get diarrhea even though you are obstructed. There was another gentleman that I went to review that wasn't a news call initially. I went to review because his blood pressure had dropped to around 96 over 50. He was also tachycardic. He was an elderly gentleman who was being treated for a hospital acquired pneumonia. He basically uh, was initially fluid overloaded so that means that he had had too much fluid um, and he had a history of heart failure so there was a lot of fluid build up in his lungs and he had been started on regular frusamide which is a diuretic so essentially it empties out a lot of fluid from your body now that can help a lot reducing the fluid in the lungs and allowing better breathing um, but if you give it too vigorously then you can dry out the patient and that's basically what had happened here his blood pressure had dropped he was tachycardic because he was hypovolemic, so dehydration secondary to um, frusamide. So for someone like this, you assess how dry they are, you look at their mucous membranes, um, you check the skin turgor, and look at their fluid balance charts, so what's coming in and what's coming out of their body. And we basically stopped the frusamide, gave him some fluids, um, so you initially give a stat bolus, so a very quick small amount of fluid to see if he responds, which he did, and then we gave a slower bag of fluids and did a chest x-ray just to monitor how congested he was. But yeah, I, I honestly feel incredibly grateful to be able to do this job, and I hope that I've not been um, very negative about the nights generally, um, and that if you're a medical student watching this, for example, you are excited um, about the things that you are going to see and the things you're going to learn. It can be terrifying, but it's also incredibly exciting and it's so rewarding when you're able to help a patient or make them get better. It is really a privilege to be able to care for patients in their most vulnerable states. Conclusion for night shifts for me is it's a great experience. I think everybody should do them. Uh, you learn a lot, you have to be more independent, but it's not something that I would wish upon anyone long term. It's very exhausting, um, you have a higher workload because you're the port of call. All the nurses will call you from serious things, so like patients dying, to um, you know prescribing something very silly that can wait for the morning and that is not urgent. And it's your job to sift through all of that and prioritize and identify those very sick patients that you need to see um, imminently. So nights I enjoyed, but I would not want to do them again anytime soon. And now I've got the weekend to try and reverse my sleep pattern and get back into normal life. Hey.